On 20th of June, 1994, Robin and Margaret Bain and three of their four children, Arawa, Laniette, and Stephen, were shot to death in Dunedin, New Zealand. The only suspects were David Cullen Bain, the eldest son and only survivor, and Robin Bain, the father. David Bain, age 22, was charged with five counts of murder. In May 1995, he was convicted on each of the five counts and sentenced to mandatory life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 16 years. David's case was taken up by businessman and former rugby player Joe Karam. In 2007, his legal team, guided by Karam, successfully appealed to the Privy Council, arguing that Robin Bain was involved in an incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. When this was about to be disclosed, he killed everyone in his family except David and then committed suicide. The case has been described as the most widely discussed and divisive in New Zealand's criminal history. David's legal team indicated they would contest the report's findings in court. The government offered David an ex gratia payment of 925000 to put an end to the drown-out dispute over compensation, which David reluctantly accepted. Police and neighbors initially speculated that Robin Bain, the father, had killed his wife and three children while David was out of the house, and then shot himself before David got home. But after a cursory investigation, the police arrested David four days later, even though they were never able to establish a motive. After numerous appeals, his conviction was overturned in 2007 by the Privy Council in Britain. He was tried again in 2009, before finally being found not guilty. At both trials, the Crown argued that David shot and killed his mother and three siblings, went on his paper run, which took about an hour, and then shot his father when he got back. After the not guilty verdict at the second trial, retired Canadian judge Ian Binney was appointed to investigate David's compensation claim for wrongful conviction. David's father used to sleep in a caravan in the back garden. He often woke up early and could have come into the house while David was out on his paper run. If so, he would have discovered the carnage and called the police. After a 12-month investigation, Judge Binney went on to say that the police had made numerous egregious errors in their investigation and had prosecuted David, even though no plausible motive ever emerged. His views reflected those of the judge at the first trial in 1995, who, after David was found guilty, no, the judge and jury at the first trial did not have all the facts. So no wonder the police version of the story seemed bizarre. But during the next 15 years, as former All Black, Joe Karam kicked the case up the field of appeal all the way to the Privy Council in London, new witnesses came forward. We learned that David's parents had been estranged for years, and that prior to the killings, his father, Robin Bain, had been very depressed. The Privy Council also heard allegations that Robin had been having an incestuous relationship with his youngest daughter, Lagnette. At the retrial two years later, a number of other people came forward to testify that prior to her death, Laniette told them what her father had been doing to her. Sean Clark was a student at Otago University and knew both David and Laniette. Mr. Clark told the retrial in 2009 that about a month before the murders, Laniette was upset and said she couldn't stand what Robin was doing to her anymore and wanted to move back home away from the camper van she was staying in with her father. Another witness, Daryl Young, said he went to visit Robin Bain at the camper van 18 months before the murders. He said he heard Robin's voice with a female before Robin came out wearing only a towel and smelling of stale alcohol. Linda Miller told the court that in 1993 and 1994, she was working in Dunedin massage parlors where she got to know Laniette. She said Laniette was distressed about what her father was doing to her and that he was raping her, basically. Mr. Kedsley, a shop owner in Dunedin, said Laniette came into his shop in a distressed state in early 1994. When he asked her what was wrong, she replied that there had been troubles at home, she was on drugs, and she was having an affair with her father. Stephen Cousins, who employed Laniette in his store before she died, said she told him that her father had been sexually abusing her for years and that it was still going on. He says he told Laniette to go to the police, 
Other witnesses said she was threatening to tell the rest of her family. One witness said the whole neighborhood knew about the incest accusation. In other words, Leniette had already disclosed to quite a few people that she was being sexually abused by her father before she died. Ashamed of his depraved behavior, his failed marriage, and fearful that he might spend the rest of his life in prison if someone took her seriously, Robin must have snapped. He wiped out everyone in the family except David, and then committed suicide. This is a credible explanation of what probably happened. It emerged slowly and took years of hard work and dog determination by Joe Karam, who wrote four books about the case. David was finally found not guilty. Robin Byne was the only other suspect, so the finger of blame inevitably points towards him. When someone kills two or more members of their own family, the term used to describe this is family side. Such crimes are rare. But when they do occur, 95% of the time the father is the perpetrator. Although it is hard to understand why anyone would want to kill their entire family, there is always a lead up. Research shows that family annihilators have usually experienced an overwhelming sense of failure in their business or personal lives prior to these events and or have deep-seated feelings of shame and depression. Robin Bain's marriage had failed years earlier and he had been reduced to living in a caravan in a state of squalor. Teaching colleagues testified that prior to the killings, he was so depressed he had lost touch with reality. One said he was robotic and like a walking cadaver. Research on familicide describes two types of killers. They are either angry or despairing. The way in which this research points directly at Robin Bain is covered here. It describes the psychological impact on a despairing type of perpetrator when a prolonged buildup of shame combines with a potential triggering event, such as public disclosure.